Tonight, the race for the White House takes flight. Welcome to the first debate of the 2024 presidential campaign live at Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee. Eight Republican candidates have qualified and have chosen to be here on our debate stage tonight. They are here to lay out their vision for America, the battle as they battle for the GOP nomination. Good evening, everybody. I'm Martha McCallum. And I'm Brett Baer. This is the very same stage on which the Republican choice for president will accept the party's nomination next summer. The eight contenders are positioned by the order they sit in the polls, with the highest polling candidates in the middle standing center stage. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Next, entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy. Former Vice President Mike Pence. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson. And North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. Some ground rules for tonight. We'll ask the questions, and then candidates get one minute to answer. Uh, if someone is singled out, you get 30 seconds to respond. And when the time runs out, we all will hear this. Very pleasant. <laughs> so tonight, these candidates have a big opportunity to break out of the pack and to explain why they are best prepared to be the Republican choice for president at a time when the likely Democrat nominee, President Joe Biden, is working to convince the country that with Bidenomics, things are looking up. We call my plan Bidenomics. I'm not sure the men in a totally complimentary way at the time. <laughs> But guess what? It's working. But is it? More than 65% of Americans say the country is headed in the wrong direction. And here's the reality for some voters we talked to here in Wisconsin this week. We have noticed a dramatic increase in prices at the grocery store just across the board. Gas is high and food is high. It's a lot of people out here homeless because they can't buy food. It's tough when you got mortgage rates at 78% versus 2 to 3. It's just you can't afford a house anymore. It's, inflation is, is ridiculous. It's killing us out here. As we sit here tonight, the number one song on the Billboard chart is called Rich Men North of Richmond. It is by a singer from Farmville, Virginia, named Oliver Anthony. His lyrics speak of alienation, of deep frustration, with the state of government and of this country. Washington, D.C. is about 100 miles north of Richmond. There's rich men north of Richmond. Lord knows they all just want to have total control. Want to know what you think. Want to know what you do. And they don't think you know. But I know that you do. Because your dollar ain't shit. And it's taxed to no end. So, Governor DeSantis, why is this song striking such a nerve in this country right now? What do you think it means? Our country is in decline. This decline is not inevitable. It's a choice. We need to send Joe Biden back to his basement and reverse American decline. And it starts with understanding we must reverse Bidenomics so that middle-class families have a chance to succeed again. We cannot succeed as a country if you are working hard and you can't afford groceries, a car, or a new home, while Hunter Biden can make hundreds of thousands of dollars on lousy paintings. That is wrong. We, we also cannot succeed when the Congress spends trillions and trillions of dollars. Those rich men north of Richmond have put us in this situation. And finally, we need to lower your gas prices. We're going to open up all energy production. We will be energy dominant again in this country. I showed it could be done in the state of Florida. I pledge to you as your president, we will get the job done, and I will not let you down. Thank you. 
Governor Christie, do you agree with Governor DeSantis just said there? And why would you be better on the economy than him? Well, look, I do agree predominantly with what Governor DeSantis just laid out. And I think that if you asked every one of us up here that we would agree predominantly with what he just laid out. Here's the difference. The difference is that we're going to have to work and make sure that we sell these ideas and we able to be able to put ourselves in a position where we get a majority of the vote, not only by winning the Congress and the Senate in 24, but also by having someone who's had the experience of doing it. Now, I was elected as a conservative Republican in a blue state with 61 percent of the vote, with a Democratic legislature against me the entire time. And we still, through hard, strong decision making, brought them around to our point of view. We cut taxes in New Jersey. We cut debt in New Jersey. We made sure that each and every time we were confronted with bad Democratic ideas, we stood and stopped them. And when there were good ideas, we brought people together to make progress going forward. Truth and accountability are the things we need to do to fight waste. And I'd say the last thing is this, Brett. We cannot sit by any longer and allow the kind of spending that's going on in Washington, because every dollar they spend is a dollar that these people are not allowed to spend on their children and their grandchildren. It's robbing our country, and it's wrong. Well, Governor, let me just follow up very quickly. New Jersey, when you were governor, had the second lowest credit rating in the nation after Illinois, and it was downgraded 11 times. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's what happens when you inherit a blue state that has done that. But when you look at what we did on debt, Brett, in that state, we cut debt in that state, debt that had been left to us by three Democratic gubernatorial predecessors of mine who ran up that debt tremendously. And what you also saw us do was to cut the unemployment rate in half. It was over 10 percent when I became governor in 2010. What we also did was cut pension payments to public employees to make sure that taxpayers were not being soaked by a public employee union system that was killing the taxpayer. Thank you, Governor. Governor Scott, I mean, Tim Scott, Senator Scott, excuse me. Uh, the song also goes after welfare programs. As a senator, now President Biden, argued for freezing federal spending, this was back in the 80s, and dealing with sacred cows. He does not talk about that anymore. You have been a senator, though, for 10 years. So what have you done to rein in the increasing size of government? Well, thank you for the question. Over the last several years, I've had an opportunity to vote against spending package after spending package after spending package. What we also need to understand is that Joe Biden's Bidenomics has led to the loss of $10,000 of spending power for the average family. When you see 16 percent inflation, your gas is up 40 percent, your food is up 20 percent, your electricity is up 20 percent. We can stop that by turning the spigot off in Washington, sending the money back to the states and allowing the decisions to be made at their own houses. I helped write the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017. We cut taxes for a single mom like the one that raised me by 70 percent for dual households by 60 percent, returning to the average family $4,000. If you don't send it to Washington, we can't spend it. That's good news for the American people. Okay, but just to, to follow up, you did, during the Trump administration, you approved uh, $4.4 trillion, $4.1 trillion, $1.7 trillion over the course of that administration. That's a lot of money. There's no doubt that during the Trump administration, when we were dealing with the COVID virus, we spent more money. But here's what happened at the end of our time in the majority. We had low unemployment, record low unemployment, three and a half percent for the majority of the population, 70, 70 year low for women. African-Americans, Hispanics and Asians had a all time low. But our inflation was at two percent. Under Joe Biden, we've seen the exact opposite. We've seen inflation explode, which led to 12 Federal Reserve increases that's devastating home buyers today. Mr. Ramaswamy, you're listening to if these I, answers. If I may, no, I mean, hold that on was one our second. administration, we're, we're going to, so I, I don't know if I get a chance to respond. He didn't mention you specifically, but we'll be with you in a second, Mr. Okay. Vice President. Uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, listening to all of this, why should voters choose you? 
over more experienced politicians on this stage. Uh, you're basically, you know, a blank slate for people. You're 38 years old. Uh, you've said that you only voted in two presidential elections before this moment, this political race. So first, let me just address a question that is on everybody's mind at home tonight. Who the heck is this skinny guy with a funny last name, and what the heck is he doing in the middle of this debate stage? I'll tell you, I'm not a politician, Brett. You're right about that. I'm an entrepreneur. My parents came to this country with no money 40 years ago. I have gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies. I did it while marrying my wife, Apoorva, raising our two sons, following our faith in God. That is the American dream. And I am genuinely worried that that American dream will not exist for our two sons and their generation unless we do something about it. And I do think Brett is going to take an outsider, because for a long time we have professional politicians in the Republican Party who have been running from something. Now is our moment to start running to something, to our vision of what it means to be an American today. If you have a broken car, you don't turn over the keys to the people who broke it again. You hand it over to a new generation to actually fix the problem. That's why I'm in this race, and we're just getting warmed up. All right, to you, Governor Haley. So why are you better positioned to turn around this economy that we've heard all of these voters talking about tonight than Mr. Ramaswamy, who is a successful entrepreneur nationally right now, He's beating you in the polls. Well, I don't care about polls. What I care about the fact is that no one is telling the American people the truth. The truth is that Biden didn't do this to us. Our Republicans did this to us, too. When they passed that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill, they left us with 90 million people on Medicaid, 42 million people on food stamps. No one has told you how to fix it. I'll tell you how to fix it. They need to stop the spending. They need to stop the borrowing. They need to eliminate the earmarks that the Republicans brought back in. And they need to make sure they understand these are taxpayer dollars. It's not their dollars. And while they're all saying this, you have Ron DeSantis, you've got Tim Scott, you've got Mike Pence. They all voted to raise the debt. And Donald Trump added $8 trillion to our debt. And our kids are never going to forgive us for this. And so at the end of the day, you look at the 2024 budget, Republicans asked for $7.4 billion in earmarks. Democrats asked for $2.8 billion. So you tell me who are the big spenders. I think it's time for an accountant in the White House. Vice President Pence. <laughs> you were mentioned there. Um, 54 percent of voters say the cost of groceries is a, quote, major problem for them. Right. You blame the Biden administration spending for that increase. But as vice president, your administration spent more than any prior, $7.8 trillion added to the national debt, $3.5 trillion of that before COVID. So does that mean that you're part of the spending problem? Well, first off, thanks for the question. Thanks for letting me respond to a re reference to our re administration's record. I'm incredibly proud of the record of the Trump-Pence administration. I mean, in... Four short years, we rebuilt our military. We revived our economy. We unleashed American energy. And we appointed three conservatives to the Supreme Court that gave the American people a new beginning for the right to life. Now, Martha, you asked earlier who's the most best prepared for this job. And I must tell you, with all due respect to all of my friends on the stage, and even to one that's probably looking on, I think unquestionably I am the best prepared the most tested, the most qualified and proven conservative in this race. I was a leader in the Congress of the United States. I led Indiana where we balanced budgets and had a AAA bond rating when I was governor. And as vice president of the United States, we spent funding to, to backfill on the, the, the military cuts of the Obama administration. And then we were there in the worst pandemic uh, in 100 years. All that being said, I was the first person in this race to say that we've got to deal with the long-term national debt issues. you got people on this stage that won't even talk about issues like Social Security and Medicare. I mean, Vivek, you recently said uh, a president can't do everything. Well, I got news for you, Vivek. I've been in the hallway. I've been in the West Wing. A president of the United States has to confront every crisis facing America. I will put our nation back on the path to growth and prosperity and restore fiscal responsibility, just as I did in Congress and as governor Mr. Vice president. and when I was vice president. But, yeah, I mean, we, I hold, on. Spot yeah, hold on. I was, so you I were was named invoked. earlier. I'm going to get Vivek first. We'll get to both of them. Yeah, this isn't that complicated, guys. Unlock American energy. 
drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear. Put people back to work by no longer paying them more to stay at home. Reform the U.S. Fed, stabilize the U.S. dollar, and go to war. The only war that I will declare as U.S. President will be the war on the federal administrative state that is the source of those toxic regulations acting like a wet blanket on the economy. So I'm not sure I exactly understood Mike Pence's comment, but I'll let you all parse that out. For me, it's pretty simple. That's something a U.S. president can do with focus, and I'll deliver on well, it. Well, let me explain well, it to you. Let me explain it to you, Vivette, if I can. I'll go slower this time. I, you know, I, I sometimes struggle with the reading comprehension. Look, I was, uh, right I was a House conservative leader <laughs> before it was cool. I actually pushed a deficit reduction act that was the last time we actually reduced the national debt in the United States when I was the leader of House conservatives. I balanced budgets and cut taxes when I was governor. I mean, look, Joe Biden has weakened this country at home and abroad. Now is not the time for on-the-job training. We don't need to bring in a rookie. We don't need to bring in people without experience. Okay, we need to bring It's 30 seconds when you have a rebuttal, okay? And, and you are up, Governor DeSantis. So here's the thing. Why are we in this mess? Part of it and a major reason is because how this federal government handed COVID-19 by locking down this economy. It was a mistake. It should have never happened. And in Florida, we led the country out of lockdown. We kept our state free and open. And I can tell you this, as your president, I will never let the deep state bureaucrats lock you down. You don't take somebody like Fauci and coddle him. You bring Fauci in, you sit him down, and you say, Anthony, you are fired. You know what? We're, we're going to bring in. I, I just want to finish responding to Mike. To I just want to respond to Mike for one second because he invoked me back. Listen, now that everybody's gotten their memorized, pre prepared slogans out of the way, we can actually have a real discussion now. The, the, the reality and the fact of the matter is... Is that one of yours? Uh, not, not really, Mike, actually. Yeah. We're just going to have some fun tonight. And the reality is, you have a bunch of people, professional politicians, super PAC puppets, following slogans handed over to them by their 400-page super PACs last week. The real choice we face in this primary is this. Do you want a super PAC puppet, or do you want a patriot who speaks the truth? Do you want incremental reform, which is what you're hearing about, or do you want revolution? Okay, and I stand on the side of the American the Revolution. I've got to address we're going to take medalism. control back here. We need everyone Remember? to have a moment on the economy. Yeah. I think that's fair. Can I address the COVID uh, there are two people who have not. We're going to no. get back to that. We are. Uh, there are two people who we have not heard from yet. So let's hear from Governor Bergram and then from Governor Hutchinson on the economy, sir. Well, great. Thank you, Martha. And of course, uh, I'm from a town of 300 people. It's a big deal to make it on this stage with all these folks. Uh, but. <laughs> But when they were, they were all wishing me well, uh, and I think I took them a little too literally when they said, go to Milwaukee and break a leg. So, <laughs> but I do want to say uh, uh, on this, we're missing something. We can't just talk about the Biden economy because the economy, energy, and national security are all tied together. We, of course, we're paying too much for our energy in our, in our state, right, in our country right now. But part of the reason why is because of the Biden policies on energy. We've got a plan right now, the $1.2 trillion of Green New Deal spending buried in the Inflation Creation Act is something that is just subsidizing China. We're, if we're going to stop buying oil from the Middle East and start buying batteries from China, we're just trading OPEC for Sinopec. And then belatedly, belatedly, the, the Biden administration says, no, we're going to put sanctions on Russian oil. Well, we put sanctions on Russian oil. Well, then it's 20 percent off. Who's buying it? China. So if you buy a battery in this country, you buy a solar panel, it's being produced in a, power, in a plant in China powered by coal, or it's being powered by oil and gas at 20 percent off. And every farmer in this country would like to buy diesel at 20 percent off, just like they're buying it in China. Governor Hutchinson, quickly. Thank you, Grant. Delighted to be here tonight. And let me just tell you that I'm a pro-life governor from a conservative state that have a conservative record in which I lowered taxes in Arkansas as governor. I created a $2 billion surplus that I passed over to my successor. And I made sure that we shrunk the size of government. We have 14% fewer state employees in Arkansas after I left government than when I took over as governor eight years ago. 
I tell that because that's what we need in Washington, D.C. We need somebody who can actually constrain the growth of the federal government, that can actually reduce the size, and I've pledged to reduce by 10 percent our federal non-defense workforce. That's a specific pledge to make that attacks the administrative state. And let me applaud some of the business partners that are here that have had success in business. But let me tell you, I've been a federal prosecutor. I've served our country in terms of being head of the DEA, in Homeland Security, in times of crisis. And while I think that that's experience that is important for the future of our country to be the president of the United States that can lead with positive solutions to be held accountable. Okay. Thank you. We have a lot of topics to get to, and I promise we're going to get to everyone if we play within the rules. Okay, next topic. More than 1,000 people are still unaccounted for in Maui uh, after the deadliest U.S. wildfire in more than a century. Hawaii's governor and White House officials said that climate change amplified the cost of human error. And a tropical storm hit California for the first time in 84 years. The ocean hit 101 degrees off the coast of Florida. And in the last month, the heat wave in the southwest broke records nearly 50 years old. So Alexander Diaz from Young America's Foundation has a question for you all. Polls consistently show that young people's number one issue is climate change. How will you, as both President of the United States and leader of the Republican Party, calm their fears that the Republican Party doesn't care about climate change? So we want to start on this with a show of hands. Do you believe in human behavior is causing climate change? Raise your hand if you do. Well, look, we're not school children. Let's have the debate. I mean, I'm happy to take it to start. <laughs> Alexander, <laughs> so do you want to raise your hand or not? I think that's yeah. the way to do. So let me just say to Alexander this. First of all, one of the reasons our country's decline is because of the way the corporate media treats Republicans versus Democrats. Biden was on the beach while those people were suffering. He was asked about it. And he said, no comment. Are you kidding me? As somebody that's handled disasters in Florida, you got to be activated. You've got to be there. You've got to be present. You've got to be helping people Can we who are doing this. The and yeah. here's the deal. Yeah. Let's just answer the question. So here's the is that a yes? Or is that a yes? Is that a hand raise? You do not. I think it was a hand raise for him, and it's um, my hands are in my pockets. No, 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 I didn't raise, I didn't raise a hand. Let us be honest as Republicans. I'm the only person on the stage who isn't bought and paid for, so I can say this. The climate change oh, agenda whoa, 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 whoa. is a That's hoax. Ridiculous. The climate is change ridiculous. agenda is a hoax. Is and we have to declare independence for it. And the reality oh, is the anti-carbon agenda is the wet blanket on our economy. And so the reality is more people are dying of bad climate change policies than they are of actual climate change. Governor, right, Governor look, Haley, are you bought and paid for? Hold on, hold on. Listen, listen, listen. I've had enough. Let, enough. Wait, enough. Hold on, hold I've on. I've had enough. I've had enough already tonight of a guy who sounds like chat GPT standing up here. And the last person in one of these debates, Brett, who stood in the middle of the stage and said, What's a skinny guy with an odd last name doing up here was Barack Obama, and I'm afraid we're dealing with the same type of amateur well, Chris, standing in stage up. tonight. Come over and give me a hug. <laughs> give me a hug just same, like you did to Obama. The same type of amateur. And, and you'll help elect me just the, like you did to Obama, yeah, too. Yeah. Give me that the same hug, type of amateur. Hey, Brett, hold on. Hold on. Hey, Brett, Governor Haley, would you like to respond? Deserves Are you so bought Brett, and paid for? what I would for? like to say is the fact that I think this is exactly why Margaret Thatcher said, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. First of all, we do care about clean air, clean water. We want to see that taken care of. But there's a right way to do it. And the right way to do it is, first of all, yes, is climate change real? Yes, it is. But if you want to go and really change the environment, then we need to start telling China and India that they have to lower their emissions. That's where our problem is. And these green subsidies that Biden has put in all he's done is help China because he doesn't understand all these electric vehicles that he's done, what that does. Half of the batteries for electric vehicles are made in China. And so that's not helping the environment. You're putting money in China's pocket. And Biden did that. So, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge the truth, which is these subsidies are not working. We also need to take on the international world and say, OK, India and China, you've okay. got to stop polluting. And that's when we'll start right. to deal with Senator climate. Senator Scott, are you bought and paid for? Absolutely. 
Are you bought and paid for? I'm sorry? <laughs> Are you bought and paid Absolutely for? Absolutely not. I mean, it, it, here's what the American people deserve is a debate about the issues that affect their lives. Going back and forth being childish is not helpful to the American people to decide on the next leader of our country. Number one, wait a second. And number two, as a kid who grew up in a single parent household mired in poverty, I wondered, was the American dream real for kids who are devastated by poverty, devastated by the challenges of life? I came to the conclusion that America can do for anyone what she's done for me. If we focus on restoring hope, creating opportunities, and protecting America. If we want the environment to be better, and we all do, the best thing to do is to bring our jobs home from China. If we create 10 million new jobs in my Made in America plan, we will have a better economy and a better environment. Let me tell you why I say that, Brett. America, do it quickly. America has cut. <laughs> I'm a Southern boy, I talk slow. So America, America. <laughs> That was quick. America <laughs> has cut our carbon footprint in half in the last 25 years. The places where they are continuing to increase, Africa, 950 million people. India, over a billion. China, over a billion. Why would we put ourselves at a disadvantage, devastating our own economy? Let's bring our jobs home. We have a lot of okay. different topics to get yep, to. We do. We thank you all. Thank you, Senator Scott. So coming up next, the candidates will weigh in on what could be a defining issue in the 2024 campaign. The first Republican debate continues moments away. Abortion has been a losing issue for Republicans since the Dobbs decision. In six state referendums, all have upheld abortion rights in this country. And even in red states, there are more swing state referendums that are coming up as we head into the elections as well on this. So, Governor Haley, what do you say to your party and to your state, which today confirmed a six-week abortion law as well, especially the impact on women suburban voters across this country? Thank you, Martha. I am unapologetically pro-life, not because the Republican Party tells me to be, but because my husband was adopted and I had trouble having both of my children, so I'm surrounded by blessings. Having said that, we need to stop demonizing this issue. This is talking about the fact that unelected justices didn't need to decide something this personal, because it's personal for every woman and man. Now it's been put in the hands of the people. That's great. When it comes to a federal ban, let's be honest with the American people and say it will take 60 Senate votes. It will take a majority of the House. So in order to do that, let's find consensus. Can't we all agree that we should ban late-term abortions? Can't we all agree that we should encourage adoptions? Can't we all agree that doctors and nurses who don't believe in abortion shouldn't have to perform them? Can't we all agree that contraception should be available? And can't we all agree that we are not going to put a woman in jail or give her the death penalty if she gets an abortion? Let's treat this like, the, like a respectful issue that it is and humanize the situation and stop demonizing the situation. Brett. Vice President Pence, Governor DeSantis, you signed a six-week abortion ban in Florida. Uh, one of your biggest financial backers said that you need to, quote, shift to get moderates or you will lose. What do you say to him and others who say politically that is a tough thing to sell nationally? Well, I would say we sold uh, the biggest election landslide victory in the history of the Republican Party in the state of Florida in 2022. That's what I did. We can win. But second of all, look, um, you got to do what you think is right. I believe in a culture of life. Uh, I was proud to sign the heartbeat bill. Uh, I remember one of the most impactful moments of my life was when I heard the heartbeat of my oldest daughter uh, in my wife's womb and then saw the sonograms of all three of my kids. What the Democrats are trying to do on this issue is wrong to allow abortion all the way up to the moment of birth. I know a lady in Florida named Penny. She survived multiple abortion attempts. She was left discarded in a pan. Fortunately, her grandmother saved her and brought her to a different hospital. We're better than what the Democrats are selling. We are not going to allow abortion all the way up till birth, and we will hold them accountable for their extremism. But just to we be clear, Governor, would you sign a six-week ban federally? 
I'm going to stand on the side of life. Look, I understand Wisconsin is going to do it different than Texas. I understand Iowa and New Hampshire are going to do different. But I will support the cause of life as governor and as president. We, we Vice must President have Pence, a, you're shaking we your must head. Have a Nash hold on, hold on, on, hold on, on Senator. Vice President Pence, you're shaking your head. What, well, look, I'm, I'm not new to this cause. After I gave my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I opened up the book and I read, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And see, I set before you life and death, blessings and curses, now choose life. And I knew from that moment on the cause of life had to be my cause. And I've been a champion for life in the Congress, a champion for life as governor and as vice president. And uh, to be honest with you, Nikki, you're my friend, but uh, consensus is the opposite of leadership. When the Supreme Court returned this question to the American people, they didn't just send it to the states only. It's not a states only issue, it's a moral issue. And I promise you, as President of the United States, the American people will have a champion for life in the Oval Office. Can't we have a minimum standard in every state in the nation that says when a baby is capable of feeling pain, an abortion cannot be allowed. A 15-week ban is an idea whose time has come. It's supported by 70 percent of the American people, but it's going to take unapologetic leadership, leadership that stands on principle and expresses compassion for women okay, in well, crisis hold on. pregnancies. I'll do that as president of the United States. He called my name, Governor sir. Haley, I she did. To that. seconds. So first of all, I will say it is in the hands of the people and that's where it should be. But when, when you're talking about a federal ban, be honest with the American people. I am we haven't honest. had 45 pro-life senators in over 100 years. So no Republican president can ban abortions any more than a Democrat president could ban all those state laws. Don't make women feel like they have to decide on this issue when you know we don't have 60 Senate votes in the House. 70 percent of the American people support legislation. Legislation but to 70 ban abortion of the after Senate a baby is capable not. of experiencing okay. pain. We you know what? I it's just going to take on. leadership. Hold on. 70 percent of the Senate Governor does Bergen not. Here. You have to be honest with the We'd American people. We have to have people. a 15 week limit. Right. Let's get Governor Bergman for one, one minute here. Um, so, but the Supreme Court did overturn Roe v. Wade. And, and the, the result of that decision was that it went back to the states. So that's where it is right now. So as I understand it, you are not in favor of a federal ban. What do you say about the states, there's about five of them, including New Jersey, I think uh, a few others, that allow abortion up until the time of birth, though? If you were president, would you be able to abide that? Well, first of all, I'm a pro-life governor of a very pro-life state. And this is issue is, of course, very important, but I am on the record and I stand behind that we should not have a federal abortion ban. Uh, we should not. And the reason why we shouldn't is very simple. It's the 10th Amendment in the Constitution. In the Constitution, which the states created the federal government, not the other way around, it says that there were certain duties allowed to the federal government delegated to them by the states. The rest are left to the states, comma, or importantly, or to the people. We need to get back to freedom and liberty for the people in this country. And we can't have, we can't have Republicans who fight for 50 years for this great cause and to return it back to the states. And then the next day they turn around and go, no, the feds should do that because the feds are stepping into people's lives. They're stepping into people's businesses. Over and over, if we say that the Fed should be in on this one, where do we stop? I say that we follow the Constitution, and this is returned to the states. This we, is where it should but be. But Governor Bergham, right. you signed a six-week ban. Time out. You signed a six-week ban. Governor Bergham, you signed a six-week ban. So you're saying federally, it's all going to go to the states. Yes, and what what is going to work in New York will never work in North Dakota, okay. and vice versa. That's Governor why 50 Asa states. That's right why here. 50 states. This, this is too important of an issue that I have to address. Uh, first of all, uh, the Supreme Court gave it back to the elected representatives, whether it's the states or whether it's the United States Congress. That's so right. there is authority, and that's why President Biden is pushing for a Democrat proposal, which is, in essence, abortion on demand through the term. So they have their extreme position at a national level. We, it's most likely going to be addressed in the states, but it's certainly fine for it to be addressed at the national level as well. Arkansas has the record of being the most pro-life state in the nation. I signed 30 pro-life pieces of legislation while I was governor. And 
every state can determine a different outcome here. And it is the most important issue for women and for the unborn child and for our country that we get this right. It's going to be a continued debate. Let's talk about it in terms of compassion, in terms of protecting the life, and also understanding how we have to enhance uh, abortion, uh, excuse me, adoption services, how we have to enhance paternal care, those right. things we've done in Arkansas and are important for our nation's future. There are a lot of issues that are very important. Uh, I'll, Senator, I'll let you, Thank you. weigh in. Yes. We cannot let states like California, New York, and Illinois have abortions on demand up until the day of birth. That is immoral, it is unethical, it is wrong. We must have a president of the United States who will advocate and fight for, at the minimum, a 15-week limit. I am 100% pro-life conservative. I have a 100% pro-life record. I got to tell you, though, we must fight for life. Our Declaration of Independence says our Creator gave us inalienable rights that include life. That is a list. That is an issue we must solve. We can't leave it to Illinois. We can't leave it to Minnesota. We can't leave it to Illinois. We must solve that issue with a 15-week limit at a minimum. Thank you, Senator. I think we're all pro-life, but Thank what you. I would love is for someone to ask Biden and Kamala Harris, are they for 38 weeks? Are they for 39 weeks? Are they for 40 weeks? Because that's what the media needs to be asking. All right. Another issue is America and the crime crisis, the homelessness crisis. American cities are in decline. People are moving out as homelessness, drugs, crime move in. Uh, there are problems accelerated. They did accelerate during the pandemic and are still rising, actually. Murders in Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, all up 30 percent between 2019 and 2022. Homelessness is up 11 percent, the largest jump in recorded history. Vice President Pence, a lot of this began in the COVID era. How much of what we're seeing happening around this country is a result of those COVID lockdowns? And is your administration in part to blame for how we got here? Well, I think what's in part to blame is the Democrats have been talking about defunding the police for the last five years. And we ought to be funding law enforcement, particularly in our major cities, at, at unprecedented levels. I mean, it's extraordinary to think about the violence that's claiming innocent lives literally every week in every major city in this country. And yet Democrats and liberal prosecutors in major metropolitan areas continue to, to work out their fanciful agendas, to, to do a, a bail reform and, and go easy. What we need is, is strong commitment to law enforcement. We need leadership in Washington, D.C. that will marshal the resources of the states, marshal the resources of the American people. But let me also say it's about opportunity. I mean, a lot of people don't know that those Trump-Pence tax cuts that we got signed into law go away at the end of 2025 if we don't have a Republican president uh, and a Republican House and a Republican Senate. When I'm president of the United States, we're actually going to cut taxes further. We're going to extend those tax cuts, and we're going to close the Federal Department of Education, block grant all that funding back to the states with a growing economy and educational choice and, and law enforcement. We will bring our cities back. Governor Christie, um, another issue. This weekend here in Milwaukee, reports say there were 30 shootings, and a number of them including kids. Uh, add that to the big increase in school shootings around the country. Democrats blame this crisis on easy access to guns. They also blame Republicans for blocking gun control legislation. What would President Christie do? You know, I'm proud of the fact, Brett, that I'm the only person along with Governor Hutchinson up on this stage who's actually running United States Attorney's Office. I ran the fifth largest office in America in a, in a state where there is significant urban crime. And the problem is not going to be solved by more money. The problem is, is, is that these prosecutors in these localities in the states are refusing to do their job and to arrest violent criminals. So what a President Christie would do is appoint an attorney general who would instruct each of the 93 U.S. attorneys that they are to take over 
the prosecution of violent crime in every one of those cities that are failing to do so. We have plenty of room in the federal prisons to lock up these violent criminals and clean up what's going on all across this country in these individual cities. Secondly, what we need to make sure that each and every one of these criminals understand is that the laws apply to everybody. And when Hunter Biden fills out a fake application, a false application for a, for a gun permit, and then is facing a 10-year mandatory minimum, which was mandated by legislation sponsored by his father, and then you have a Justice Department that walks away from those charges, we're telling people that the law doesn't apply to everybody. In a Christie administration, he would go to jail for 10 years. What about a President Ramaswamy? What does a President Ramaswamy do about guns? So the reality is we have a crime wave in this country and we know how to fix it. The question is, do we actually have the spine to do it? More cops in the streets who are on the streets able to do their jobs without looking over their shoulder for getting sued. And we also have a mental health epidemic in this country. Just over the same period that we have closed mental health institutions, we have seen a spike in violent crime. Do we have the spine to bring them back? I think we should. As president, I will. But it's not just drugging up people in those psychiatric institutions with Zoloft and Seroquel. It's a deeper issue. I think faith-based approaches can play a role here, too. We're in the middle of a national identity crisis. And I say this as a member of my generation. The problem in our country right now, the reason we have that mental health epidemic, is that people are so hungry for purpose and meaning at a time when family, faith, patriotism, hard work have all disappeared. What we really need is a tonal reset from the top, saying that this is what it means to be an American. Yes, we will stand for the rule of law. Yes, we will close the southern border where criminals are coming in every day. And yes, we will back law enforcement because we remember who we really are. And that's also how we address that mental health epidemic in the next generation that is directly leading to violent crime Can I across speak this country. Governor DeSantis, really quickly. Here. Governor DeSantis. We don't have an identity crisis, Vivek. We're not looking for a new national identity. The American people are the most faith-filled, freedom-loving, idealistic, hard-working people the world has ever known. We just need government as good as our people. Well, Mike, I think the difference is you might have, as some others like you may have on this stage, it's morning in America speech. It is not morning in America. We live in a dark moment, and we have to confront the fact that we're in an internal sort of cold cultural civil you war. Are and we have to recognize the American that people with the failed win. government in Washington, D.C. We just need government as good as our people again. So, I guess, so let me Governor just finish DeSantis, addressing that slogan, wait, wait because I don't know what that slogan Brett, means. Mark, we need I to shut down the administrative DeSantis. state. Crime, Mark, that's actually how we translate crime it. Crime has been Mark, on the rise in Florida, Governor DeSantis. How do you stop? Crime. Well, actually, crime's at a 50-year low not in Florida. In, we're, in we're, we're happy with that. Well, the statewide, it's a 50-year low. And so here's the thing. These hollowed-out cities, this is a symptom of America's decline. And one of the biggest reasons is because you have George Soros funding these radical left-wing district attorneys. They get into office and they right. say they're not going to prosecute crimes yeah. they disagree with. The inmates start running the asylum. There's one guy in this entire country that's ever done anything about that, me. When we had two of these district attorneys in Florida elected with Soros funding who said they wouldn't do their job, I removed them from their post. They are gone. And as president, as president, we are going to go after all of these people because they are hurting the quality of life and they are victimizing innocent people in every corner of this country. And it will stop when I get into office. Okay. One more here before the break, Governor Bergen. Well, Rhett and Martha, I just thought it was interesting. You asked your question about the problems we're having in big cities. Nobody ever asked the question of what about the crime wave in small towns? Because in a small town, neighbors help neighbors. People understand each other. If a farmer gets sick, everybody comes together and helps them get the crop off. There's accountability, there's transparency. One thing that I think this country could use is somebody in the White House that understands small town values because that's our road back to get this country on track again. Governor Hutchinson. As former head of the DEA, I understand the drug crisis in America. And right now, whenever you look at the challenges in our inner, inner city, uh, there's three simple words that would be helpful. One, enforce the law when it comes to crime. Secondly, let's deal with the challenge of fentanyl. And it's both about 
stopping the fentanyl coming from Mexico, but it's also about education of our young people, making sure that we have uh, the tools that are needed for addiction counseling. That's what we expanded in Arkansas as well. Whenever you look at the underlying challenge of America, though, no one likes to see an America with smash and grab in our inner cities. As President of the United States, that will stop. It starts at the top with the respect for our justice system that a former president who's under indictment has undermined by attacking judges, by attacking prosecutors, by attacking the system and saying he's aggrieved. And so we have to have respect for our justice system and the rule of law, and it starts at the top with the president of the United States. Brett, thank Brett, you. Hold we'll on. Take a break. Brett. Um, so, speaking of that, right now you are looking live at Fulton County Jail, where former President Donald Trump will be processed tomorrow. So next, the candidates will have an opportunity to talk about the coming trials of Donald Trump. But well, we have a lot to get to in this second hour of this GOP primary debate. Policy discussions the Americans want to hear you all on. China, Ukraine immigration, education. But we are going to take a brief moment and talk about the elephant not in the room. Former President Trump has been indicted in four different states on 91 counts. He will be processed tomorrow in Georgia at the Fulton County Jail for charges relating to the 2020 election loss. You all signed a pledge to support the eventual Republican nominee. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. Just hold on. So just to be clear, Governor Christie, you were kind of late to the game yeah. there, but no, you raised I, your I, hand? No, I'm doing this. Look, <laughs> look, I'm doing this. And I know this. you didn't. Whoa, whoa. No. Come. What's and the look, what, what, look, here's the here's the bottom line. Someone's got to stop normalizing this conduct. Okay? Now and now whether or not whether or not you believe that the criminal charges are right or wrong, the conduct is beneath the office of President of the United States. And, 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 you know, this is the great thing about this country. Booing is allowed, but it doesn't change the truth. It doesn't change the truth. Mr. Ramaswamy, you raised your hand supporting. No. I'd like to hey. get in and respond. Let's just speak the truth, okay? President Trump, I believe, was the best president of the 21st century. It's a fact. And Chris Christie... Honest to God, your claim that Donald Trump is motivated by vengeance and grievance would be a lot more credible if your entire campaign were not based on vengeance and grievance against one man. And if people at home want to see a bunch of people blindly bashing Donald Trump without an iota of vision for this country, they could just change the channel to MSNBC right now. But I'm not running for president of MSNBC. I am running for president of the United States. We're skating on thin ice, and we cannot set a precedent where the party in power uses police force to indict its political opponents. It is wrong. We have to end the weaponization of justice in this country. 30 seconds, Governor DeSantis. Let me tell you no, no, I'm sorry. 30 seconds, you, seconds Governor You make me laugh, because you, both sit, ways, you, sit, you sit here in an answer. You sit here in an answer. Right Hold on one second. You sit here and answer. Go ahead, Hold Governor on. Christie. Hold Go on, on, Governor Christie. Hold on. Well, so listen, the more time we st spend doing this, the less time they can talk about issues you want to talk about. So let's just get through this section. Governor Christie. You, you sit here talking about how you want to stand up for the rule of law. Yes. And law and order. And the fact is that it can't be selective. In your book, 
you had much different things to say about Donald Trump than you're saying here tonight. That's and, not true. Well, it is very true. That is not true. It's very true. I read it, because and I know— Because there's a difference between look, bad behavior and illegal behavior, way, Chris, and you as a prosecutor way, should know yeah, better. Yeah, I, you know what? I know a lot there's better. There's a difference between I bad know, behavior. And I know a lot better than you do. You've never done it like you've never done anything to try to advance the interests of this government except to put yourself forward as a candidate tonight. And here's the thing. We've stood up for law and order. I did it as U.S. attorney. I did it as governor. And I am not going to bow to anyone when we have a president of the United States who disrespects the Constitution. He said, he Chris, said, your MSNBC contributor he said, okay, hold on. Now, these are he said, Martha, have to call out the truth. Martha, it's important to say that the president said, Donald Trump said, it's okay to suspend the Constitution. Now, the oath you take is to preserve, protect, and defend, not suspend. I will always stand up for our Constitution, regardless of the political pressure. Right, we have another question for you. We're going to get everyone in on this issue, but I have another question. I have another question. Hold on, you will. All right, so President Trump's former vice president is on this stage tonight. He has faced hecklers on the campaign trail over his actions on January the 6th. On that day, the vice president moved forward with the certification of the election. So do you believe that Mike Pence did the right thing, Senator Scott? Do you believe he did the right thing? Absolutely. He did the right thing. Number one. <laughs> Number two. Thank you, sir. We should be... We should be asking ourselves a bigger question about the weaponization of the Department of Justice. When I'm president, the first thing I'll do is fire Merrick Garland. Second thing I'll do, fire Christopher Wray, because we need Lady Justice to wear a blindfold. Without that, no one has confidence in our justice system. Seventeen percent of Republicans have confidence in our Department of Justice. Here's why. We keep seeing not only the weaponization of the Department of Justice against political opponents, but also against parents who show up at school board meetings. They're called, under this DOJ, they're called domestic terrorists. Firing Christopher but, but, but that's not, okay. but that's not shut down the FBI. Mr. Actually, have the courage to get it right. Mr. Ramos, not, not only that, let me finish my comments. Yes. Not only that, in addition to that, we see the SWAT team show up at pro-life activist homes with guns drawn because this DOJ uses their power, uses their authority, not just against political opponents, but against conservatives and conservative causes. It is time for a change in America, and I will bring that change to the greatest nation on God's Martha, green earth. Martha. We have an important but Governor question DeSantis, still to Do you believe that Mike Pence did the right thing on January 6th? So here's what we need to do. We need to end the weaponization of these federal agents. But that's but not I will do that. That's not the question. Here, I, I know, but here's the thing. You're gonna answer this the election <laughs> is not about January 6th of 2021. It's about January 20th of 2025, when the next president is going to take office. I know what the Democrats would like to do. They want to talk about all these other issues, but we've got to focus on your future. We've got to focus on reversing the decline of our country. Right, right. I learned in the military, I was assigned uh, with U.S. Navy SEALs in Iraq, that you focus on the mission above all else. You can't get distracted. So Republicans, we've got to look forward and we've got to make sure Pence. that we're bringing the message that can win Pence. in Pence. November Pence. 2020. Do not answer the question. Pence. Do not answer the question. Vice Pence. President Pence, what, what, do you, of the what, what do you think United Vice States is to support and defend the Constitution of the United States? I think, I, I think the American people deserve to know whether everyone on this stage agrees that I kept my oath to the Constitution that day. There's we, no we, more important duty. So, so answer the question. Yeah. Thing. I've, I've answered this before. So, yes. No, why are we, he, Mike, Mike did his duty. I got no beef with him. But here's the thing. Is this <laughs> what we're going to be focusing on? I'm relieved. Going we forward, will. the yeah. rehashing of this? I'll yes. tell you, Governor the DeSantis, Democrats would love that. We and they will win well, if we Governor let him get away with it. I'm not letting Biden hang out in the basement this time. We're going to run him ragged around this country, and we're going to hold him accountable. Yeah. Let me just say, Governor DeSantis, we spent an hour talking about policy. Former President Trump is beating you by 30, 40 points in many polls. So it is a factor in the GOP primary. Governor right. Hutchinson, you did, did not raise your hand. I did not raise my hand because there's an important issue we as a party have to face. 
And over a year ago, I said that Donald Trump was morally disqualified from being president again as a result of what happened on January 6. More people are understanding the importance of that, including conservative legal scholars who says he may be disqualified under the 14th Amendment from being president again as a result of the insurrection. This is something that could disqualify him under our rules and under the Constitution. And so, obviously, I'm not going to support somebody who's been convicted of a serious felony or who has dis is disqualified under our Constitution, and that's consistent with RNC rules, and I hope everybody would right. agree with me. Right. Right. Yeah, we're going to move on, and we're going to... Martha, can I answer the question? Can I get in on okay. this? Okay, I'd like to answer... You, no, I've already like been in on it, Vice on. President okay. Pence. All right, I'd like to answer the question Go you ahead. asked and not give a pre-canned speech. Mike Pence stood for the Constitution, and he deserves not grudging credit, he deserves our thanks as Americans for putting his oath of office and the Constitution of the United States before personal, political, and unfair pressure. And the argument that we need to have in this party before we can move on to the issues that Ron talked about is we have to dispense with the person who said that we need to suspend the Constitution to put forward his political career. Mike Pence said no, and he deserves credit for it. Okay. Uh, Governor Haley, we haven't heard from you on this. Do you agree? Do you agree that Vice President Pence did the, did the right thing that day or not? I do think that Vice President Pence did the right thing, and I do think that we need to give him credit for that. But what I will also tell you is, look, I mean, when it comes to whether President Trump should serve or not, I trust the American people. Let them here, vote. Here. Let them decide. Here, but here. what they will tell you is that it is time for a new generational conservative leader. We have to look at the fact that— Three quarters of Americans don't want a rematch between Trump and Biden. And we have to face the fact that Trump is the most disliked politician in America. We can't win a general election that way. Governor Berger? Governor Berger? Governor Berger, an opportunity. Happy to answer the question. Mike Pence did the right thing on January 6th. But I want to say, you started off the top of this hour saying we're going to talk about China, Ukraine, education. We are. China is the number one threat to our country. And every minute that these eight candidates spend talking about the past instead about the future is time that is just the, the you know who loves it? Biden loves it, but China loves it when we're talking about the past. Okay. As promised, we were going to spend a few questions on it, let people say what they wanted to say. And now, indeed, we are moving on to the subject. The of U.S. Ukraine. has committed nearly 77. Can I speak on this issue? I was. You kind of did an, you, you answer on this. <laughs> issue. You, you did. You did say answer. something. Yeah. yeah. I thought we thought you were done, but you uh, no, please. I wasn't done. Well, Mike, why don't you say this? Join me yeah. in making a commitment well that on day one you would pardon Donald Trump. I'm the only candidate on the stage who had the courage to actually say it. That's that is how we move our nation forward I don't know and why turn the page forward. That's exactly Trump right. Will be convicted of these crimes. You should make be able to make a commitment. The same uh, justice system that was this fact, corrupt. There's a difference between you and, and me. Yeah, I'm not a professional actually, politician. That's I've the difference. Actually, who can answer uh, a question? I've actually given pardons. When I was governor of the state of Indiana, it usually follows a finding of guilt and contrition by the individual that's been convicted. So, we'll look, we'll, if I'm president of the United States, we'll give fair consideration to any pardon request. But if I may, <laughs> if I may, you know, it's not about looking back at, at January 2021. It's about January 20th, 2017. I put my left hand on Ronald Reagan's Bible. I raised my right hand. And I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And it ended with a prayer, so help me God. It was a promise that I made to the American people, but I also made it, it made it to my Heavenly Father. Every day for four years, I sought to keep that oath. And everyone on this stage needs to make it clear whether or not they'll do the same if they earn this job and the confidence of the American people. Now, look, I've made it clear. I, I had hoped that the issues surrounding the 2020 election and the controversies around January 6th had not come to this, had not come to criminal proceedings. I would rather they had been resolved by the American people and the American people alone. But no one's above the law. 
And President Trump is entitled to the presumption of innocence that every American is entitled to, and we will make sure and extend that to him. But the American people deserve to know that the president asked me in his request that I reject or return votes unilaterally, power that no vice president in American history had ever exercised or taken, uh, he asked me to put him over the Constitution. And uh, I chose the Constitution, and I always will. I had no Vice right president to overturn Pence. the election, and Kamala Harris will have no right to overturn the election when we beat them in 2024. Thank you, Vice President Pence. Now we are moving on to other issues. The U.S. has committed nearly $77 billion in aid to the Ukraine war. The administration is now asking Congress for $24 billion more. Regardless of that, the specific, specifics of that plan, is there anyone on stage who would not support the increase of more funding to Ukraine? We would, I would not Europe, support it. Europe needs to step up. I mean, I would have Europe step up and do their job. Right, Mr. Ramaswamy, you're... But you're saying you would not, too, Governor DeSantis? I will have Europe to pull their weight. Uh, right would, now, they're not doing you that. You would not support and I think more we need to do, to And I think our support should be contingent on them doing it. And I would have support in China uh, to, be able to, take, uh, to be able to take China um, and do what we need to do with China. Mr. Ramaswamy, you would not support an increase of funding to Ukraine? I would not. And I think that this is disastrous that we are protecting against an invasion across somebody else's border when we should use those same military resources to prevent across the invasion of our own southern border here in the United States of America. We are driving Russia further into China's hands. The Russia-China alliance is the single greatest threat we face. And I find it offensive that we have professional politicians on the stage that will make a pilgrimage to Kiev, to their Pope, Zelensky, without doing the same thing for people in Maui or the south side of Chicago okay. right, or Brett. Kensington. I think on. that we have to put I'm the in. interests of Americans Me first, he was secure to. our own border instead of somebody else's. He was referring and the reality is, this is also how we project okay. strength and by making America strong at home. Thank you. All right. We heard, we heard the names. Let's, Governor let's, let's Christie first. All right, yeah. look. I did go to Ukraine, and I went to Ukraine because I wanted to see for myself what Vladimir Putin's army was doing to the free Ukrainian people. And let me tell you, I want you all to look around this arena tonight and imagine that every one of these seats was filled. And if every one of them was filled, there would still be 2,500 more children outside to make over 20,000 who have been abducted, right. stolen, ripped from their mothers and fathers, right. and brought back to Russia to be programmed to fight their own families. They have gouged out people's eyes, cut off their ears, and shot people in the back of the head, men, and then gone into those homes and raped the, the daughters and the wives who were left as widows and orphans. This is, this is the Vladimir Please. Putin, this is the Vladimir Putin who Donald Trump called brilliant and a genius. If we don't stand up against this type of autocratic killing we in the world, to we Korea. will be next. You were mentioned, I have a question you were for mentioned, Governor Haley. We'll come back. Vice President right. Pence was mentioned. You get 30 seconds. Yeah, well, let me, let me be clear. Anybody that thinks that we can't solve the problems here in the United States and be the leader of the free world has a pretty small view of the greatest nation on earth. That is incorrect. We can do both, Vivek. We've done both. We've been the leader of the free world and the arsenal of democracy for years. The Reagan doctrine years ago made it clear. We said, if you're willing to fight the communists on your soil, we'll give you the means to fight them there so our troops don't have to fight them. Vivek, if we do the giveaway that you want to give to Putin to give him his land, it's not going to be too long before he rolls across a NATO border, and frankly, our men and women of our armed forces are going to have to go and fight him. I want to let the Ukrainians fight and drive Putin an and the Russians back out 
about I, it's I, Russia. I, I, I want to just briefly address Pence, to to make that Vice fight. President Pence. I have a newsflash. The USSR does not exist anymore. It fell back in 1990. Did I say the real USSR? threat. You talked about the communists. And the real communists that we have to address right now is the... Do you not have any idea what Vladimir Putin's aims are? You already spoke. Now I actually have something to say. Vladimir Putin has been saying he wants to reestablish the old Soviet sphere of influence. You've made your point, Vice President. Vice President Pence. I'm sorry if I insulted him by calling him a communist. He is a dictator and a murderer. And the United States of America needs to stand against authoritarianism. Right. Mr. Ramaswamy, 30 Briefly seconds. Respond. The real threat we face today is communist China. And we are driving Russia further into China's arms. The Russia-China military alliance is the single greatest okay. threat we face. Okay. Nobody in either political party is talking about it. And I am, the, I am the only non-neocon on this stage is going to keep us out of war. Mr. Vice President, between we can't hear Mr. Vice President. Is to give Russia Mr. everything Vice President. they've got. Mr. Vice President. Give them a promise that Ukraine will never be in NATO. And then somehow Mr. Vice President. China will not think about taking Taiwan. We achieve peace through strength. Mr. Vice America President. America needs to stand for freedom. Okay, here we go. I think we need to when, establish some what, ground rules When here, we folks. hear this bell, yes. that, that means your time's done. done. <laughs> so, Mr. Vice President, we appreciate your aggressiveness here. 30 seconds is 30 seconds. Mr. Ramaswamy, you were mentioned. You get 30 seconds. So the reality is that today, today, Ukraine is not a priority for the United States of America. And I think that the same people who took us into the Iraq War, the same people who took us into the Vietnam War, you cannot end it. You cannot start another no-win war. And I do not want to get to the point where we're sending our military resources abroad when we could be better using them here at home to protect our own borders, okay. protect the homeland. All right. That will be my top priority in foreign I, policy. I think we gave you more than, this than the 30 homeland. seconds in the rebut. So I do want to get to some other people because everybody, uh, we, we respect everybody's time here. So, Governor Haley, um, you did not raise your hand, meaning that you would support more funding for the Ukraine war. You have uh, said of Governor DeSantis that um, you didn't appreciate it when he initially called it a territorial dispute. Why? First of all, the American president needs to have moral clarity. They need to know the difference between right and wrong. They need to know the difference between good and evil. Right. When you look at the situation with Russia and Ukraine, here you have a pro-American country that was invaded by a thug. So when you want to talk about what has been given to Ukraine, less than three and a half percent of our defense budget has been given to Ukraine. If you look at the percentages per GDP, 11 of the European countries have given more than the U.S. But what's really important is go back to when China and Russia held hands, shook hands before the Olympics and named themselves unlimited partners. A win for Russia is a win for China. We have to know that. Ukraine right. is the first line of defense for us. And the right. problem that Vivek doesn't understand is he wants to hand Ukraine to Russia. He wants to right. let China to eat Taiwan. He wants to go and stop funding Israel. You don't False. do that to friends. What you do False. instead is you have the backs of your friends. Ukraine is a front line of defense. Putin has said, if Russia, once Russia takes Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. That's a world war. We're trying to prevent war. Look at what Putin did today. He killed Pergozin. When I was at the U.N., the Russian ambassador suddenly died. This guy is a murderer, and you are choosing a murderer over, over a pro-American country. First of all, first of all, first of all, Mr. Ramaswamy, you have 30 seconds. Mr. DeSantis, you know, Governor Nikki, DeSantis, I wish you well in your future career on the boards of Lockheed and Raytheon. You know, I'm not on but the, the fact of the matter, and you know, you Boeing came off of it, but you've been pushing this lie. This you've been pushing this lie want, all week, Nikki. You want Nikki. to go and defund Israel? This, you want to okay, let me address that. I'm glad you brought you that up. Go and give I'm going to address Russia? each of those right now. You this is the false he lies of a professional politician. There you have it. So the reality is, let's say you have no foreign policy experience, and it shows. And you know what? The foreign policy experience that you all have shows in the pointless wars we've gotten into. I have to address that. So our relationship with Israel will never be stronger than by the end of my first term. But it's not a client relationship. It is a friendship. 
And you know what friends do? Friends help each other stand on their own two feet. So I will lead Abraham Accords 2.0. I will partner with Israel to make sure Iran never is nuclear armed. But you know what I love about Israel? And I've been there probably in the last 10 years more than most people on this stage. You know what I love about them? I love their border policies. I love their tough on crime policies. I love that they have a national identity and an iron dome to protect their homeland. And so, yes, I want to learn from the friends that we're supporting. And what puzzles no, me cut the, is, uh, no, I want to learn from those and apply you, those to protect our homeland, that Mickey. Israel that needs is the answer. America, America needs on? Israel. Okay, they Governor DeSantis, Governor DeSantis, you were mentioned in the territorial dispute. Not only... Uh, no, it's not so a territorial as, as dispute either. President of the United States, your first obligation is to defend our country and its people. And that means that. you're sending all this money, but you're not doing what we need to do to secure our own border. We have tens of thousands oh, wow. of people we can who are being killed because what well, we're not handling and both. And both so I am going to declare time. it a national emergency. I'm, I'm not going to send troops to Ukraine, but I am going to send them to our southern border. When these drug pushers are bringing fentanyl across the border, that's going to be the last thing they do. We're going to use force and we're going to leave them stone cold okay. dead. We're, we're actually Very going quick. to move on to China. We're going to talk about China. Okay. The Governor Burgum. China has the biggest navy in the world, the biggest army in the world. Now they have warships, warships off the coast of Alaska. They are threatening Taiwan. In coming years, China will have 1,500 nuclear warheads, it's believed. The U.S. just arrested two sailors accused of spying for China within our military. So the question is, how would you deter China as a president, Berger? Well... This is the number one issue we're facing, and of course we haven't been talking about it, and we act like that letting Russia win in the Ukraine uh, is like a gimme as opposed to a gift to China. Russia has become China's gas station. But how would we do it? Uh, the Biden administration is a complete fail. China imports 10 million barrels of oil a day, more than any other country in the world. They do not even have all the food they need to feed everybody in that country. So they don't have energy security or food security. But the Biden administration sends Blinken, Yellen uh, over there. Uh, they, they're, they're over there. Talking. They don't even bring up energy because they're too busy trying to kill the U.S. energy here. And what we need to do is not meetings, not press releases, uh, because something that would send a lot more than a press release is actually harpoon missiles. We need anti anti-ship missiles on Taiwan, the way that you have a war never start, which is the goal, the way you have peace through strength, is that you actually have strength, you actually have deterrence. Right. And what we have in, in, in what we've got going on in Ukraine is an example of when deterrence fail. What, we, what is an example there of Biden's disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, the fact that he greenlighted Putin moving into Ukraine, and then now they see weakness, and when they see weakness, they make a move. And we have to be strong, and we have to be strong both in Ukraine, and we can solve the southern border. Absolutely, we can do that. Because guess what? There's only 19,000 855 authorized people for the Border Patrol. But they're not all staff because the Biden administration doesn't enforce law enforcement. But Biden administration wanted to put 87,000 people in the IRS as opposed to giving the money and the support we need to our own Border Patrol. Okay. Senator Scott. Senator Scott on China. That same question. Can I speak about China? Let's, let's fire the 87,000 IRS agents and hire or double the number of Border Patrol agents. I just left Yuma, Arizona about two weeks ago. The most pressing need of the American people from a national security standpoint is our southern border. It has led to the death of 70,000 Americans because of fentanyl, plus six million illegal crossings since President Biden has taken office, and 200 people on our national security watch list have been caught at our border. How many have not been caught at our southern border? If we just spend $10 billion, we could finish the wall. For $5 billion more, we could have the military-grade technology to surveil our southern border to stop the flow of fentanyl and save 70,000 Americans a year. That should be the priority of this government. And as the next president of the United States, I will make that border wall complete. Thank there you. are many I more questions on China. Say, I do want to ask I want to say, about— I want to say I couldn't agree more. 
It's not just the 70,000 from fentanyl. We've lost 200,000 people to overdoses since Biden took office. That's 300 people a day. We're taking mass casualties, and those aren't, that's a statistic, but these are sons and daughters, nieces and nephews that we're losing. We've got North Dakota troops down there flying night helicopter missions from San Diego to the Gulf Coast trying to stop these transnational criminal organizations. They've got better funding on their side than we've got on our side. Yeah. Speaking of which, we're Governor Hutchinson, speaking of which, Brent, images Brent, from Brent, earlier this cartels. month, Brent, Governor Hutchinson, Hutchinson with Mexico, with Vice President Mexico Pence, policy. images from we earlier this month. I, 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 we yep, yep, yeah. the Vice President Pence, United it really States. doesn't help. I'm asking a question. Thank earlier you. this month, sh images showed suspected cartel members crossing into Texas with rifles. Do you consider this an invasion? Would you authorize lethal force along that border? There would be lethal force used by the Border Patrol law enforcement as needed to protect the border. Absolutely. When you look at the military, the military has to be used for intelligence gathering purposes. This is not unusual. Whenever I was in the Bush administration, we went down there and met with President Vicente Fox of Mexico and asked his help in going after the cartels. And he looked at me and said, they're a problem to us as well. And so we joined together and we took down the Ariana Felix brothers leading the Tijuana cartel. And that made a difference. Ramon was shot and killed and Ben Amin was captured. Cooperation makes a difference. We cannot be successful going against the cartel unless we bring in Mexico as a partner. We have to use economic pressure to accomplish that. President Obrador has not been helpful, and we have to use economic pressure that this administration is not using. The rule of law has to matter on both sides of it. Okay. This is critical. I've done it. We know what needs to be done. The military has to be limited in its use. When after 9-11, we had the global war on terror, and guess what? We protected the border at the same time. You can do both. Okay, uh, let's go to Governor DeSantis. So, as president, would you support sending U.S. special forces over the border into Mexico to take out fentanyl labs, to take out drug cartel operations? Would you support that kind of American military use? Yes, and I will do it on day one. Here's the thing. The cartels are killing tens of thousands of our fellow citizens. You want to talk about a country in decline? You have the cartels controlling a lot of part of your southern border. We have to reestablish the rule of law, and we have to defend our people. The president of the United States has got to use all available powers as commander-in-chief to protect our country and to protect the people. So when they're coming across, yes, we're going to use lethal force. Yes, we reserve the right to operate. How many more tens of thousands are we going to let to die? I am sick. I've met angel moms throughout this country. I met a lady in, in Texas named Tracy, and her son took one Percocet that was laced with fentanyl, immediately died. That is happening all across this country because of the poison that they are bringing in. So as president, would I use force? Would I treat them as foreign terrorist organizations? You're darn right I would. You know, Vice President Pence, <laughs> Vice President Pence, why would you be better at this issue than Governor DeSantis? Governor DeSantis on the campaign trail refers to your administration as not finishing the wall. Right, right. Look, we secured the southern border of the United States of America and reduced illegal immigration and asylum abuse by 90 percent. When Joe Biden took over, he threw open the southern border yes. of the United States and the wave of humanity, the wave of fentanyl that's been eloquently described here is, is, a, is a wave of human tragedy across this country. But Martha, you began this evening talking about who is best prepared to be the next president of the United States. And I have to tell you, with all humility, I, I was there when we negotiated uh, through the government shutdown and got the funding available to build the wall. 
I was negotiating on Capitol Hill around the clock. I negotiated the Remain in Mexico policy on behalf of the President of the United States. And AC, you're so right. It's because we used economic pressure to bring the Mexicans to the table, and they allowed us to have people wait in Mexico while they applied for asylum and ended asylum abuse overnight. We got the Mexicans to deploy their National Guard to their southern border and, uh, and to our southern border as never before. And I want to promise you, as President of the United States of America, I will engage Mexico the exact same way, and we will partner with the Mexican military, and we will hunt down and destroy the cartels that are claiming lives in the United States of America. Okay, thank you. A another issue that is related to this is that almost 7 million migrants have crossed this border, our southern border, during the Biden administration. So, Governor Christie, what would you do about the 7 million who are here? How would you handle them? What would you do? Look, Martha, the first thing we need to do is to stop any more from coming. That's the first thing we need to do. Then the next thing we need to do with the folks that are here is to, again, as we've talked about all night tonight, we have to have law and order in this country. We have to enforce the law. And what that means is to make sure that people who come here illegally are not rewarded for being here illegally. We have so many wonderful people from around the world who are waiting in line, following the law, to try to come here and pursue the American dream. And those people are waiting and waiting and waiting because we haven't dealt with the problem of the folks who are here we have to have them detained. We have to make sure that they are not rewarded for having broken the law. And one last thing on this fentanyl issue. With China, we can't take our eye off of that ball. Right. Yes, it's important that we secure the border. Very important, as I just said. But China is sending these chemicals to these drug cartels for them to create the fentanyl that is killing hundreds of thousands of our citizens. The Chinese are engaging in an act of war against us, killing our citizens. We better make that priority one in our conversations with China and to try to straighten that relationship out, because if we don't, we're going to lose more and more of our citizens. I just want to clarify, would you send those people back? Of course. You'd have to. We have a lot of issues that Americans care about. Next up, we're going to talk about the crisis in education, as millions of American children are not proficient in reading or math after this. The nation's report card was the weakest ever for American school children, uh, exposing chronic absenteeism, deep declines uh, for reading and math for 15-year-olds and 13-year-olds. Governor DeSantis, you would eliminate, you said, the Department of Education. But as president, would you still have a responsibility to fix this crisis as we see it? Absolutely. The decline in education is one of the major reasons why our country is in decline. We need education in this country, not indoctrination in this country. And in Florida, Florida, we stood up for what was right. First, we had schools open during COVID, and a lot of the problems that we've seen are because these lockdown states lock their kids out of school for a year, year and a half. That was wrong. We stood up. I took a lot of fire for that. I was, uh, I was pilloried by the media, but I stood for our kids. And as president, I'll stand for you and your kids as well. But we have to make sure that what our schools are doing is focusing on solid academics. In Florida, we eliminated critical race theory from our K through 12 schools. We eliminated gender ideology from our K through 12 schools. And we have elevated the importance of American civics in teaching our kids about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. As president, I'm gonna lead an effort to increase civic understanding and knowledge of our Constitution. We cannot be graduating students that don't have any foundation in what it means to be an American. Mr. Problem, Ramaswamy, Mr. Ramaswamy, Mr. Peck, Mr. Ramaswamy, hold on, Senator Scott. You've said that the Department of Education, the FBI, the ATF, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the IRS, the Department of Commerce, many of these should not exist. That's correct. So to the education question, how would you deal with the crisis? So look, we have a crisis of achievement. Let's shut down the head of the snake, the Department of Education. 
Take that $80 billion, put it in the hands of parents across this country. This is the civil rights issue of our time. Allow any parent to choose where they send their kids to school. End the teachers' unions at the local level to allow public schools to compete. And then revive our national identity where every high school senior should have to pass the same civics test that frankly every immigrant, including my mother, had to pass in order to become a citizen of this country. And the fact of the matter is, look, there's part of education policy that also rests with the family. I didn't grow up in money, but you know the word privilege gets used a lot? Well, you know what, I did have the ultimate privilege of two parents in the house with a focus on educational achievement. And I want every kid to enjoy that. So part of the problem is we also have a federal government that pays single women more not to have a man in the house than to have a man in the house, contributing to an epidemic of fatherlessness. And I think that goes hand in glove with the education crisis as well, because we have to remember education starts with the family, and the nuclear family is the greatest form of governance known to mankind. Okay. So, Governor Burgum, uh, Governor Haley has said... Governor Haley has said that biological boys playing in girls' sports is the women's issue of our time. You said that even though you signed a ban on this in North Dakota, that there hadn't been one instance where it was actually needed. Are you saying that you think that too much is made of this issue? No, I'm saying in North Dakota we made a priority of protecting women's sports, and we've done that uh, in our state. Uh, but I would absolutely do that. But I do think when we start talking about education and we think that we're going to have a federal government one size fits all, we're just completely losing track of the fact that education differs by state. Some, some school districts are doing a fantastic job, some less so. But the idea that every school district, state, and every teacher is somehow indoctrinating people is just false. You know, when I was building a company from scratch, you know, with small town kids, and we went, you know, grew up in a town of 300, but we built a global company in 132 countries with over 100,000 customers, we listened to those customers, we spent time with them, we talked to them, we did that. And as governor, well, education is one of the biggest part of a state budget. So as a governor, I go, I shadow a student. I don't, the night before I find out the students, the student finds out, I'm going to go to every class with them. I don't sit and lecture school districts how to do it. I go and see the experience. And there's a lot of things that have to change. But what needs to change in education is ev it's innovation. We're doing it the same way we did it 50 years ago with innovation, not regulation. I would get rid of the Department of Education. I would give block grants to schools, but I'd give them on merit based on who's doing the most innovative. I just got done holding the seventh annual Governor's Conference on Innovation Education. You should see what the people are doing when you, get, you cut loose the red tape, get the burden off their back. They care. Teachers in this country, the vast majority of them care about those kids. They're working in low-paying jobs, and they're fighting fighting for those kids and their families. Governor, Governor Haley, you said that this is the women's issue so, of our time. First, I'll, I'll tell you, as, you know, as a parent, the one thing you want is for your child to have a better life than you did. And we can talk about all of these things, and there's a lot of crazy woke things happening in schools, but we've got to get these kids reading. If a child can't read by third grade, they're four times less likely to graduate high school. So we need to make sure we bring in reading remediation all over this country. We need transparency in the classroom because parents should never have to wonder what's being said or taught to their children in the classroom. Parents need to be deciding which schools their kids go to because they know best. And let's put vocational classes back into the high schools. Let's teach our kids to build things again. Hey. When we do that and we allow that innovation, that's when it'll get back. And yes, I will always say I'm going to fight for girls all day long because strong girls become strong women. Strong women become strong leaders. Another, and biological boys don't belong in the locker rooms of any of another, our kids. Another point we, on the education. Are, we're we're going to start. First question is going to go uh, to you, Vice President. So this is a lightning round of questions. 30-second answers, please. Uh, President Biden will be 82 years old on Inauguration Day. Nearly 70% of Americans say that he is too old to serve. Should presidents have to pass a mental and physical test in order to serve Vice President Pence? Well, I, it might be a good idea to have everybody in Washington, D.C. pass a mental and... <laughs> but, uh, 30 seconds, no. The American people can make those judgments. But let me say, I, I'm running for president of the United States because we don't need a president who's too old. And we don't need a president who's too young. We need a president who's been there. 
We need a president who knows how Congress works, how the White House works, how states work. And on this education issue, Martha, I was fighting against No Child Left Behind when Republicans were doubling the Department of Education. I'll also shut down the Federal Department of Education. And when I was governor, we doubled the size of the largest school choice program in America. And we'll give school choice to every family in America so, when I'm um, in the White House. This is a lightning round, Mr. Ramaswamy. I think you were mentioned there. You're 38. You're the youngest on the stage. You've said, and you just said, you want a civics test or public service for those under 25 to be able to vote. So the question is, do you want a mental acuity test for presidents over 75? I believe in the people of this country to tell the difference between somebody who's an automaton and somebody who's actually a thinking agent in the White House, which we don't have in there today. And I will tell you, I want to address Vice President Pence's comment. I think we do need somebody of a different generation to lead this nation forward. Look at the way I've run this campaign. Going to the south side of Chicago, to Kensington, in the middle of Philadelphia, where traditional Republican candidates don't go. We have an opportunity to build a multi-ethnic, working-class majority to deliver a landslide. And I think I'm the only candidate in this race, young or old, black or white, to bring all of those voters along to deliver a Reagan 1980 revolution. Same, We're going to do it in 2024. Same question to you, Governor. You never voted in a presidential election until okay. 2020. I, I will answer that. This I will answer that. Seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Seconds. Quick answer. You guys have to get control of this debate. Everybody's going to get a chance to get of this debate. Listen, listen. We're getting control of the debate. This is a lightning round, not rolling thunder. <laughs> Governor Hutchinson, you have 30 seconds on the same question. Uh, on education, first of all, look at Arkansas. We have to compete with China. I built computer science education. We led the nation in computer science education, going from 1,100 students to 23,000 students taking it. This is how you compete with China. As President of the United States, I will make sure we go from 51% of our schools offering computer science to every school in rural areas and urban areas offering computer science for the benefit of our kids, and we can compete with China in terms okay. of technology. Thank you, sir. By, by, this is going to go to... This is, this is coming to you. Um, I, I, we're trying to do a, a quick round of different topics here. So, w Senator Scott, faith is on decline in this country. You talked about it a little bit before tonight. So is there a role for a president of the United States in changing that? What would you do to change that? Well, our nation was founded upon the Judeo-Christian values that has made this the greatest nation on God's green earth. I'm a big believer in Ephesians 3.20 that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. Our responsibility should be to model the behavior we want others to follow. On education, the only way we change education in this nation is to break the backs of the teachers' unions. They are standing in the doorhouse of our kids locking them into failing schools and locking them out of the greatest future they could have. As President, Governor DeSantis, would you support some mandatory military service for all Americans? I think it should be voluntary. I'm somebody that volunteered to serve, inspired by September 11th, and I deployed to Iraq uh, alongside U.S. Navy SEALs in places like Fallujah, Ramadi. And it's uh, something that I think has taught me, you know, when you go in that, that type of environment, Anything you have, your personal agenda, you check it at the door. You go there, and it's about focusing on the mission above all else. And guys come together, and they get it done. And that's how I would view being the president of the United States. It's not about me. It's not about all these other side issues. My sole focus will be on your future and reversing this country's decline. Okay, now for something uh, a little out of this world, and this is for you, Governor Christie. Do you believe that the recent spike in UFO encounters... Oh. <laughs> I get the UFO it's, question? It's, yeah, you know. Come on, there man. You know. <laughs> no, but, but, okay, we've been hearing a lot of... We've been hearing here a lot of testimony in Congress, and people are taking this a lot more seriously, and we're hearing that, you know, there are things going on that people aren't aware of. So... If you were president, Governor Christie, would you level with the American people about what the government knows about these possible Look, encounters? Martha, and especially coming from a woman from New Jersey, <laughs> I, I think it's horrible that just because I'm from New Jersey, you asked me about unidentified flying objects <laughs> and Martians. Um, we're different, but we're not that different. Um, <laughs> look, um, of course, the job of the president of the United States is to level with the American people about everything. 
The job of the President of the United States is to stand for truth. The job of the President of the United States is to be a role model for our children and our grandchildren. And so whether it was UFOs or this problem of education, and Tim's right, by the way, and I started this in 2010 by going right after the teachers unions in New Jersey and drove them down to an all-time low popularity rating because they were putting themselves before our kids. That is the biggest threat to our country, not UFOs. Okay. Well, coming up, we've got closing arguments. Plus, right after the debate, Hannity is live from the spin room right here in the Pfizer Forum with reaction from all the candidates as soon as they step off the stage. We'll be back after this. 20 years ago, 70% of American adults said they were extremely proud to be an American. That number has now plummeted to just 39%. In his pitch to get to the Oval Office, President Reagan called America the shining city on a hill, a beacon of hope and optimism. So in your closing statement tonight, please tell American voters why you are the person who can inspire this nation to a better day. These are 45 seconds, and we begin with Governor Burgum. I understand why America's hurting. Biden's inflation is choking us. I grew up in a small town. My dad died when I was freshman in high school. My mom, widow of three, went back to work. Every job I had growing up was one where I took a shower at the end of the day, not at the beginning of the day. Our, our cities are less safe because of the fentanyl pouring into this country. Our economy is being crushed by Biden's energy policies, which are raising the cost of every product you buy, not just the gasoline at the pump. One thing that I'll do as president, I'll secure the border. I'll get this economy sprinting, not crawling like it is right now. <clears throat> and I would say that other thing is for sure, when I'm on a horseback, in the Badlands of North Dakota. It looks like the horizon is just limitless. And when you can almost see beyond that horizon, you can see that this great country, our future is unlimited. But we've got to focus on innovation, not regulation. We've got to cut the red tape. We've got to drive ourselves forward. The way we win the Cold War with China is by growing our economy and through innovation. And as president, I will bring out the best of America. I will improve every American life. Governor well, we Hutchins. hope you're back on your horse soon, Governor. <laughs> Governor Hutchinson. Our nation is in trouble, and it's in trouble because of failed leadership. And the solution is not four more years of Joseph Biden. The solution is not four more years of Donald Trump. The solution is new leadership that can bring bold ideas to America and to bring out the best of America. A president's number one responsibility is to bring out the best of our people. That's what Ronald Reagan did, and he did it with optimism and hope for our country, with a consistent conservatism. That's exactly what I bring. As president, I'll bring out the best of America in terms of individual responsibility, building our economy, in terms of securing our border, enforcing the rule of law. I'll bring out the best of America in terms of our national character, our faith, and our hope for the future. Join in this fight. Asa2024.com. Thank you. Senator Scott. Thank you. I was a disillusioned young man growing up in a single-parent household mired in poverty. I wondered if the American dream was real for a kid like me. I can stand before you today and say the dream is alive, it is well, and it is healthy. I had the good fortune of a mom who worked 16-hour days making sure we have food on our tables. She taught me that if you're able-bodied in America, you work. If you take out a loan, you pay it back. If you commit a violent crime, you go to jail. And if God made you a man, you play sports against men. I'm Tim Scott. I'm asking you for your vote. And if you're in Iowa, I'm asking you to caucus for me. You can go to votetimscott.com for more information or to make a contribution. Governor Christie. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Martha. Look, everybody on this stage wants to be the next president of the United States. And the only way that's going to happen is if we beat Joe Biden. I'm the only one on this stage who's ever beaten a Democratic incumbent in an election. I did it in a deep blue state, being outspent three to one. Beating a Democratic incumbent is not easy. The last Democratic incumbent president who was defeated was Jimmy Carter. 
and he was defeated by a conservative governor from a blue state who knew how to get results, who stood for the truth, who cared about accountability, and stood strong and hard against waste. Those are the very things that I did in my eight years as governor of New Jersey, and it's exactly what I'll do as president of the United States. Believe me, the Democrats want some other nominee who's never beaten the Democratic incumbent. I'm the one who can win this race, and if you give me the chance, I will restore our country by winning it. Thank you. Governor Haley. Several weeks ago, I dropped my husband, Michael, a combat veteran from Afghanistan, off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they had never been, all in the name of protecting America. If they are willing to protect us from there, we should be willing to fight for America here. I will beat Joe Biden, and he knows that. I will strengthen our economy, and we'll bring this inflation down. We will put transparency in the classroom. We will secure our borders. We will have the backs of our law enforcement, and we will make sure we have a strong national security. And once again, we will make sure we have an America that is strong and proud. We have a country to save. Join us. Go to NikkiHaley.com, and let's get it done. Vice President Pence. Thank you, Brad and Martha, for this evening. It's an honor to be here. Joe Biden has uh, weakened America at home and abroad. The disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, their war on energy, runaway spending that launched the worst inflation in 40 years, a crisis at our southern border, an assault on our values and liberties, and the American people have had enough. But I know we can bring it back. But different times call for different leadership. The Republican Party owes the American people the choice. Proven leadership at the national level that knows how to move a conservative agenda forward. We proved in the Trump-Pence years you can turn this country around faster than you can imagine. And I have faith we will again. Because I have faith in the American people. The good, decent, hard-working, faith-filled, idealistic people of this country. And I have faith that God is not done with America yet. And if we will renew our faith in one another and renew our faith in him who has ever guided this nation since we arrived on these wilderness shores, I know the best days for the greatest nation on earth are yet to come. Thank you. Mr. Ramaswamy. I was born in 1985, and I grew up into a generation where we were taught to celebrate our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways we are really just the same as Americans, bound by a common set of ideals that set this nation into motion in 1776. And this is our moment to revive those common ideals. God is real. There are two genders. Fossil fuels are a requirement for human prosperity. Reverse racism is racism. An open border is not a border. Parents determine the education of their children. The nuclear family is the greatest form of governance known to man. Capitalism lifts us up from poverty. There are three branches of government, not four. And the U.S. Constitution, it is the strongest guarantor of freedom in human history. That is what won us the American Revolution. That is what will win us the revolution of 2024. Thanks for letting me introduce myself tonight. Thank you. Governor DeSantis. Governor? This is our time for choosing. We will send Joe Biden back to his basement and we will reverse the decline of this country. I'm a blue collar kid. I work minimum wage jobs to be able to make ends meet. I understand the importance of the American dream and I know how that slipped away from so many millions of Americans. We'll restore it. I'm a veteran who served in Iraq. I know what it means to put service above self. I'm also a dad and a husband to six, five, and three-year-old. I understand the importance of protecting parents' rights and the well-being of our children. In Florida, we showed it could be done. I made promises, and I delivered on all of those promises. 2024 is make or break. We're not getting a mulligan. No excuses. I will get the job done, and as your president, I will not let you down. God bless you all. Well, we want to say thank you. Thank you to all the candidates on the stage tonight, and thank you to Milwaukee.
Thank you, everybody. We will see you on the campaign trail from debate.